Hi, Year 10, it's Mrs. Kahoot again. Welcome to Lesson 2. Um, since we last spoke, I'm hoping that the video will have helped you to complete Section 3 of your coursework. Um, now remember, I'm, you know, I'm not too worried that this isn't typed up. Uh, what I'm looking for is for when we do come back, you to have a really good idea, a draft that, or something that I can mark, something I can look at, that you can then type up, type up properly. And the idea is that these um, videos not only consolidate your current knowledge because you know we're not behind in learning any new content so the idea is that they're consolidating your knowledge because all this stuff that your knowledge that you're using in your coursework is going to be in the exam as well and then obviously you are having a go at some of the coursework tasks so we're kind of trying to kill two birds with one stone here um, now this video this week should help you with this section here that you're seeing on your screen so the key skills for your sport now before you watch this video my advice to you is to write down what you think all the key skills for your sport are so the sport that you're doing your coursework on um, so if you want you can pause me and then have a go at writing them down so for example if I was doing football I'd be looking at passing receiving dribbling tackling jockeying shooting headering um, you could maybe add some extra bits in there, but try and break it down into as much detail as possible. If you're struggling to think of what the key skills for your sport are, use Google. If you've got access to the internet, use it. Okay, That's fine for you to give ideas and, and to, for it to give you a starting point. What isn't fine if, is if you're just copy and pasting, for example. Right, so let's get started with what we're learning. So we're going to go through, we're going to recap bones so labeling the bones because you need to be able to know what bones you are using and what joints you are using when you perform a skill we're going to recap muscles because again you need to know in order to do this movement analysis we need to be able to tell me what muscle is allowing the movement to happen uh, we'll have a quick look at lever systems it might apply it might not apply planes of movement and axis of rotation the other bit for this section is also the um, environmental and difficulty continuums, but I'm going to do that next week. So it's a bit of a two-parter for this section. Okay, so on your screen, you are going to see all the bones that you need to know. Now, just remember with phalanges, that is for your fingers and your toes. Oh, it does repeat it twice. That's fine. Don't panic. Don't worry. It's on there, Mrs. Cahoon. So you need to be able to know the bones. So if we just go through, if my laptop decides it's going to work, here we go. So we'll start at the top. So your skull is otherwise known as your cranium, really important as protection. Um, for example, if you're in a rugby scrum, it protects your brain. You've got your vertebral column. Here you can see the front view and the view from behind. So it goes down. This is your spine, made up of loads of smaller bones strung together. Shoulder joint. So you've got your scapula at the back. So it's that disc shaped bone that covers your shoulder and your humerus, which is your um, upper arm bone. Clavicle then, otherwise known as your collarbone. And then moving on to the chest region, your ribs. Again, performs that protection function for your heart and your lungs. Your sternum, otherwise known as breastbone. So again, just going through the bones in your arm, humerus at the top, and then you've got your radius and your ulna in your lower arm. Hip joint, otherwise known as your pelvis. You've got your femur, which is your large bone here, your thigh bone, which connects up into your pelvis joint. Knee joint then, so the bone that as actually forms your kneecap is known as your patella. Tibia, femur again is being highlighted. And then fibula, so this is the smaller bone that sits behind your shin bone. Um, but just remember the difference between those. You've got tibia on the top and then fibula behind don't get confused um you don't need to know that ankle joint now it hasn't labeled the ankle joints but obviously you have your tarsals which form your ankle joint metatarsals which form the bones in your foot and phalanges which form your toes and then the same within your hand so you have your it goes carpals metacarpals phalanges so i always think um tarsals metatarsals t t for tarsals t for toes so in your feet and then obviously carpals goes, uh, the met carpals, metacarpals are in, found in your hand. So it can get confusing because obviously they're similar sounding. We're not going to look at the functions today. I would expect you to know that. We are going to move on to look at joints. So just remember a joint is a place where two or more bones meet and it's vital for that 
function of movement, which we is obviously really important for this section because we're talking about movement analysis. So we are using this information that we know about bones, joints and muscles to be able to break down how that skill is performed, that movement analysis of that skill. So hinge joint found in your knee and your elbow as shown in the picture. So you've got a 100 meter sprinter and you've got some rowers. They only allow flexion and extension. So they're really powerful joints, really good for power and speed. But when we're talking about flexion extension, flexion is decreasing that angle around the joint, so bending. And then extension is increasing the angle at joint, so straightening. So here you can see the handball player has got flexion here at her elbow joints. And then here for this forehand um, shot, you can see Roger Federer has got, Federer has got extension here at his elbow. So again, this is just breaking down the skills. So when you when you need to do this in your coursework, if you could picture or get a picture even of somebody performing that skill that you're going to be talking about, and go through and highlight at all the joints what movement is occurring. And then that's what you need to write about. So if doing it in diagram form with a picture of somebody first helps you, you, know, you can label the bones, label the muscles, and then writing that out, that might that might be a, a helpful way to be able to do it, a much easier way than just trying to to write straight away. You know, drawing a diagram, getting a picture, annotating it, and then what you have annotated and labelled in terms of bones, joints, movements, and muscles, you then transfer over and you write write it up essentially. Ball and socket joint then, so slightly different allows a lot more movement. They're probably the mo the most mobile joints in your body, most commonly found in your body. Uh, found in your shoulder and your hip and as you can see here it's a, a round shaped bone that fits into a disc shaped bone so there's your ball and then there's your socket which again is what allows for the greater range of movement now examples of movement then that can occur at these so you've got flexion and extension still so it's really hard for people to get their head around flexion and extension at a ball and socket joint but in this case if we're talking about the shoulder if this person was to raise their arm up, that would be flexion at the shoulder joint. If they were then to pull their arm back, that would be extension at the shoulder joint. Um, with the hip, it's a little bit easier. Obviously, if they were going to come down and touch their toes, you've got flexion at the hip. And then when they're stood up right, like in this diagram, you've got extension at the hip. And that would be the same if you were moving side to side. Abduction and adduction then. So that would be either moving away from this midline of the body you see here or moving towards it so for example if this person was to um, bring their arms up so that they were in line here this would be abduction because they're taking their arms away from this midline of their body if they were to bring their arms back down towards their side you have got adduction so adding back to the middle and that's the same at the hip joint taking the legs out and in so this is just a reminder and then here in this picture you can see this person has got abduction at their hip so they're taking that away from their midline of the body. Ball and socket joints also allow rotation and circumduction so a slight difference between these two movements although obviously the definition is giving you the same thing. Rotation is only when you partly rotate around the joint so here this person's rotated to a certain point and stopped Whereas circumduction is where you'd move all the way around the joint. So, for example, bowling in cricket. Um, we don't need to look at the... Okay, so just uh, we didn't need to look at the structure of a synovial joint. Um, we're going to look at muscles then. So, we've talked about joints. We've talked about what movements occur at them. Now, in order for that movement to happen at the joint, your muscles are going to need to contract and relax. So, as well as knowing the bones and the joints and the movements you need to be able to analyse what muscles are contracting and which muscles are relaxing. So here you've got a nice diagram. I'm just going to go through it for you. So you've got a front, frontal view and a view from behind to look at the key muscles you need to know. Um, here you've got, start at the top then, so we've got pectorals here, which form your chest, your pecs. Um, trapezius is found in your neck, so these muscles that go up into your neck. Deltoid is this sheet of muscle that comes around the shoulder, as you can see here. Bicep is the muscle that is seen to be on top when you flex your arm. Abdominals then down here, your stomach muscles. Quadricep in your thigh. And then view from behind, you've got your tricep. So in your upper arm, that muscle that sits behind. Now remember, your bicep and your tricep are example of antagonistic pairs. 
So these two muscles will work together, one will contract and one will relax to allow flexion and extension at the elbow joint. Latissimus dorsi are the muscles that run either side of your spine or vertebral column. Gluteals then, so the buttock muscles. Hamstring here is the muscle that sits behind your quad. And again, like the bicep and tricep, the hamstring and the quadricep are um, antagonistic pairs. So work together, one contracts, one relaxes. And gastrocnemius. Now, when you do your coursework, you're going to need to talk about which muscle is contracting and which muscle is lengthening. So here it gives you the example of a bicep. So during flexion here at the elbow, so decreasing this joint, the bicep is contracting, the tricep is relaxing. And during extension, the bicep relaxes and the tricep contracts. And that does mean that the bicep is the agonist and the tricep is the antagonist. Here, the bicep is the antagonist, the tricep is the agonist. So it's the muscle that is contracting that is always known as the agonist and the muscle that is relaxing is always known as the antagonist. Now, the fixator is known as the muscle that stabilises the joint. So stabilises around the joint to allow this movement to take place. Now, sometimes you might see that. I wouldn't necessarily write about that in your coursework. Just stick to the traditional agonist and antagonist. Which muscle contracts, which muscle relaxes to allow that movement around that joint. Okay, last piece of the puzzle then that we want to look at is lever systems, planes of movement and axis of rotation. Now this is going to be quite quick going through it, so you might need to go back, stop the video and look at the diagrams. Example of a first class lever system within your body is your head. So if you are a footballer and you talk about header in, you're going to talk about using your first class lever system. The muscle, the fulcrum remember is the joint, the load is what you are trying to move and the effort is the muscle that is contracting. So in this example of a first class lever system, if my laptop again, it's so slow, besides work, here we go. So you've got the muscle in the neck contracting the weight of the head and the neck joint. It gives you this example here of how the neck is extended. The trapezius has allowed that to happen. Obviously the weight, the load that is being moved is the head. So second class lever systems are arranged slightly differently. Again, we're still talking about a joint, the weight and the muscle. In this example, we are looking at a second class lever system in your leg, in your lower leg, in your ankle. So ankle joint is where the movement takes place. Muscle in your leg, so your gastrocnemius all the way up. And then the weight of your body against gravity is what you're trying to move. And then third class lever system. So here you have got your bicep, so you've got flexion. So here the bicep muscle is the muscle that is contracting. That is the effort. The load is the weight in your hand. And then the fulcrum is your joint, which is your elbow joint. I'm just going to skip through this. So planes of movement then. As you can see, there are three different types. So we're talking about moving through that plane. So you have to move through that plane. So for example, sagittal here splits the body side to side. And that will be running backwards and forwards. Frontal splits the body front to back, moving side to side. Transverse splits the body top to bottom, rotating round. Clue is in the name. Transverse, top to bottom, frontal, front to back, sagittal, side to side. Axis of rotation then. Slightly different, people get confused. You've got your longitudinal axis. This is about rotation in the body. It goes through your head and out. So that goes the length of your body. L for length, L for longitudinal. Transverse, so it goes through the body side to side, so through one hip and out the other hip, only allows rotation on this example. So for example, transverse would be somersault, longitudinal would be 360 spin, and then frontal, the bar goes through your front and out your back, so only movement would be side to side, for example, so a cartwheel. Just show you real quick, longitudinal, hammer thrower, transverse, and frontal cartwheel. The planes and the axis actually link together. So if you have a look at that diagram, that would be self-explanatory. Same here, frontal and frontal, and then transverse and longitudinal. Right, my advice to you now is to go back to your coursework have a go at the section, have a go at learning facts in your fact book, 
and I will see you next week. Don't forget you can log on to Teams to talk to me if you need any support. Also, just email me anytime. Happy learning. Take care, guys. See you next week. Bye.